Would you please give a warm welcome to Mr. Arlen Schumer. Welcome everybody to Superheroes in the 60s, Comics and Counterculture. This is 1960. This is Hal Jordan, the secret identity of Green Lantern. And he's saying, no one in the world suspects that at a moment's notice I can become mighty Green Lantern with my amazing power beam and invincible green beam. Golly, what a feeling yeah. it is. Ten years later, in 1970, Green Lantern was getting knocked on the head. How did we get in America, in comics, from the early 60s, where heroes were enthralled to science and technology, to the end of the 60s, this image from 1972, that we'll show a little later, that to me talks about the death of the 60s, the death of the character culture. Now when we're talking about the 1960s, they didn't really begin right on the decade, 1960. The 60s as we know it, as you know, it really started when Kennedy gets assassinated. Right on television we see Oswald, his murderer, getting assassinated. The race riots of the 60s, the music of the 60s, the Beatles, the anti-war Vietnam War protesters, the Vietnam War itself. These are images that are seared into the collective of consciousness of America. The assassinations of the 1960s, Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy. Here's Life magazine documenting the end of the decade. And it was in the 60s that our heroes, our American heroes, used to be the cowboy as emblemized by John Wayne. But later in the 60s, our villains became the heroes. So outlaws like Bonnie and Clyde became the heroes. Outlaws like Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid became the heroes. Midnight cowboys were cowboys that became heroes. And yet the superheroes were a part of that counterculture. This famous image from Easy Rider, we see the lead character, Peter Fonda, known as Captain America. Even MASH, a groundbreaking 1970 film, even though it took place in the Korean War, was really a statement about the Vietnam War. So what I'm going to show you is how did the heroes in comics in the early 60s, like Superman, The Flash, Green Lantern, these could be seen as establishing and conservative heroes, how did we make the change to the anti-superheroes, the Spider-Mans, the Doctor Stranges, the Green Arrows? How is it that a superhero can learn to cry in the 1960s even though he's an android? So that's why I'm titling this presentation Superheroes in the 60s Comics and Counterculture, and that's what we're going to see today. Now, any discussion of superheroes in America has to start back in 1938 on a newsstand. Look closely at the bottom and what do you see? The very first superhero that really established the comic book and superheroes being entwined. Action Comics number one, the first appearance of Superman. The very first page of Superman, if we look down in the lower left corner, we see the writer, Jerry Siegel, saying he's the champion of the oppressed. When Superman starts out right from the beginning, in issue number one, Superman's not fighting interplanetary villains or Lex Luthor. He's championing universal peace. He's actually going to figures that represent the Eastern European and Asian dictators that were rising in the 30s and tries to basically solve the problems. In another early story, one of the dictators is saying, what do you want to do with us? Well, I'm going to stop the war by having you two fight it out amongst themselves. The early Superman covers during World War II actually have him, in a sense, um, metaphorically fighting Hitler and Hirohito. Life magazine commissioned the Superman creators to create this odd sort of two-color story in Look magazine all about how, what would Superman do if he actually fought the war? But for the meantime, he was fighting it symbolically through covers like this. And in the back of the comics, if you were a kid reading, you could join the Superman of America Club. So right from the beginning, Superman and the superheroes are tied in with American ideals and values. And that's why you get classic images like this. All Superman really is, and a lot of the superheroes, 
are modern American mythological versions of classic American mythological heroes like Uncle Sam. In fact, the creators of Captain America were influenced by the success of Superman. Here they are, Jack Kirby on the right, real name Yaakov Kurtzberg from the Lower East Side, and his writer partner Joe Simon. Here's Joe Simon, he was also an artist, his first sketch of Captain America. Here's how it looked on page one. And if we look at issue one, we go close up, there he is actually fighting Hitler. But Captain America, oh, this is the novel Cavalier and Clay that came out about 10 years ago. It won the Pulitzer Prize. And it was basically a Romana clef about the creation of comic books. So Michael Chabon has his superhero, the escapist, actually punching Hitler, which he took from the comic books of the day that sprouted up in the wake of Superman's success. So you have this early 1930s version of Daredevil fighting Hitler. And all the superheroes in the wake of Superman took up the cause of the war. So you have Batman, you have Wonder Woman appearing, and she's fighting what they used to call the Japanazi rats in the racism of the day that was closeted. Marvel Comics, the competition to Superman in DC. You had the Human Torch fighting the Nazis. You had the Submariner. Even Captain Marvel teams up with a comic book version of Uncle Sam, who had his own comic. Tom, I, I saw this comic posted, I think, on the wall of your, uh, of your class. Yep. Here's the Flash fighting the Nazis. Even Green Lantern goes off to war. You can see when they were all grouped together as the Justice Society of America, they're basically representing the United States of America when you see images like this. And at the same time, in the little backup features of Superman, he would be promoting all American values like eating right, physical health. There's nothing like cereals, milk to give you that Superman energy. So right from the beginning, superheroes are tied in with advertising to promote their products and become American icons. Now what happens when World War II ends? We go from covers like this to all of a sudden Superman domesticated, tamed. Without the war to fight, the superheroes in the late 40s, they start to lose their way. And other genres creep in, like science fiction. You have Wonder Woman out in the Old West. Western comics became very popular, along with the advent of television stars like Roy Rogers. All of a sudden, the superheroes start getting pushed out of their own superhero comics by these Western genres. The last issue of All-Star Comics in the early 50s has a, a very interesting title, Mystery of the Vanishing Detectives. Why? Because the very next issue, the superheroes actually vanish, and the comic was retitled All-Star Western. Then another genre in the late 40s that replaces superheroes, funny animal comics. You even have Green Arrow and Speedy, the superhero archers, being replaced in their very own comic by these funny characters, Dover and Clover. You have a Captain America knockoff called The Shield being replaced in his own comic by a teenage backup feature called Archie, which later became, of course, the Archie Comics Empire. You had characters like Plastic Man being edged out of their fun and fantasy by another genre by the end of the decade that replaces superheroes, and that's the horror genre. So you had really fun, fantasy, light-hearted characters like Captain Marvel all of a sudden having to deal with horrible images like this. You have Captain America's comic being retitled Weird Tales. The most successful horror comics in the early 50s were these called EC Comics. And maybe you've seen some of these reproduced. This is in the early 1950s, ghastly images like this were being noticed by psychiatrists, most specifically Frederick Wortham, who in the early 50s wrote a famous or infamous book called Seduction of the Innocent that basically put forth the idea that juvenile delinquency and all the ills of teenagers in the early 50s were caused by reading comics. This book became such a cause celeb that it initiated a whole media backlash this is actually an article in Europe, in England, about US comics being banned. And this is not a book burning in Germany in the 30s. This is in Kansas in 1953. That's how bad 
parents were trained to believe that comics were terrible. And that's what caused that little seal you might remember seeing, because it's not on every comic nowadays, the Comics Code Authority, to self-govern and self-censor the comics themselves. So what happened was the few remaining superheroes that were left in the early 50s started to fight the new threat, which was the communists. So you had Submariner fighting commies, you had Captain America, commie smasher. Well, in the 50s, the other dominant motifs in the pop culture was the car, outer space, and speed. And we can see it in these advertising images. So what happens to really jumpstart the superhero revival is that an editor of DC Comics in 1955 said, what if we take these old discontinued superheroes from the 40s and modernize them. Nowadays, the phrase would be retrofitting or, you know, uh, reinventing. But basically, the Flash appearing in 1956, the first Silver Age superhero, because the 1940s were called the Golden Age. And when we look at the Flash as being the first new hero of the 1950s, he's all about speed. And the artist, Carmen Infantino, to this day created definitions and images two-dimensionally of speed that have never been equaled. Even this incidental panel of a car, you could see that he took from the designs of the 1950s, the fins and cars like this. Right around the time Flash starts appearing, the other theme of outer space, this was Sputnik, the first satellite launched by Russia in 1957. This put America into a tailspin. How are we going to keep up with the Russians? They hire ex-Nazis like Werner von Braun to jumpstart the U.S. space program. So all of a sudden, by the late 1950s, the new American hero is the test pilot. You can see it in an advertisement like this from a magazine. So, in comics, what do the heroes become? You have Hal Jordan becoming a test pilot. He becomes Green Lantern in 1959. When we look at the 1959 Green Lantern, he's just a reinvented Green Lantern from the 1940s. You can see the difference in costume design. In the 1940s, it was baggier. They based superheroes on magicians wearing capes. And you can see the sleekness of Gil Kane's design in the 19 1959 was very forward-thinking. And yet, the ideas of the DC Comics superheroes of the late 50s were still the same old-fashioned ideas you could see in a panel like that. Of course, all these heroes that I'm going to show you today are all the heroes that Hollywood is now making into the movies you're seeing. And I've always felt that comics were 25 years ahead of the American pop culture. So the fact that they're making movies now of heroes created 50 years ago tells you what will Hollywood be making 25 years from now because the stuff happening in comics right now is years ahead of what Hollywood is doing. The other big motif of the 1950s was the Atom. This is an exhibition in Brussels, Belgium in 1958 called the Atomium. So the Atom symbol of nuclear power was seen on all different levels of American culture. Ergo in comics we have Ray Palmer who becomes the Atom also designed by Bill Kane. But again, what was the Atom? Just another reinvented, remodeled hero from the 1940s. And here's Ray Palmer telling students at a graduation ceremony, follow science, it may lead you to the stars. This was the feeling in American culture at that time. The astronaut was being seen as the new American hero. The astronauts were in costume in a way. They had helmets. So in DC Comics, you had the equivalent of that, Adam Strange, known as Earth's first spaceman. And what he would do is he would get zapped by a beam and wind up teleported to another planet. If anybody's seen John Carter from Mars, that's where all of these ideas come from. So even though Carmine Infantino, the artist of The Flash, drew otherworldly landscapes, again, these DC heroes were really kind of de facto agents of the American government putting forth the same American ideals. So in the 1940s, you had the Justice Society of America. In the 1960s, you have the version of it called the Justice League of America. 
And it was the success of the Justice League of America by DC Comics that affected another comics company called Atlas. You might know them by their later name, Marvel Comics. They were led by a publisher named Martin Goodman. He has a golf date with Harry Donenfeld, the head of DC Comics. And it's during that golf match in 1961 that Donenfeld mentions that Justice League of America is a big sales success. So Goodman goes back to his head writer, a guy named Stan Lee, real name Stan Lee Lieber. Like a lot of American Jews in the 20th century, they all changed their names, anglicized them, so they could make a living. What was Stan Lee and Martin Goodman doing in Marvel Comics? They were doing these horrible knockoffs of late 50s monster movies. Grog, Metallo. Well, Stan Lee said, okay, if you want me to write a bunch of superheroes, I'll do it. But he didn't want to write superheroes like the way DC Comics were written. So this is the synopsis to the very first issue in 1961 of the Fantastic Four, the first real Marvel comic that we can see by the cover here was again a bit of a knockoff of the Justice League of America. But if we look closely at the Fantastic Four, who by the way, maybe you've seen the movie that was made in 2005, not that very good, but again, everything comes out of Fantastic Four number one, and the artist as well as the storyteller was Jack Kirby, Yaakov Kurtzberg. What's the story of Fantastic Four? Again, torn from the headlines, the space race. Four people go up in space, and we can see from this panel progression that they encounter cosmic rays. This was stuff Jack Kirby was taking right from National Geographic he was reading. They crash back on Earth. The first person to gain a power is Sue Storm, otherwise known as the, the Invisible Girl. But again, every single new hero, even at Marvel Comics, was based on something they had created years before. So here's a Marvel Comics story that Lee and Kirby did called the, I Was the Invisible Man. Then you have Ben Grimm, who turns into the thing. And when we look at his orange, staley rock body, again, we see the Kirby monster characters that preceded it. Reed Richards becomes the super stretching guy. Mr. Fantastic? Well, Plastic Man precedes Mr. Fantastic by years. Even DC Comics had their own version of Plastic Man called the Elongated Man. Then you have Johnny Storm, the Human Torch. What happens to him when he becomes the Human Torch? Well, he's just a remodeled version of the 1940s Human Torch. One of the interesting things about the early Fantastic Four, this is the last panel, is that Martin Goodman, the publisher, didn't like Stan Lee's original title, which was the Fabulous Four. He said, Stan, can you change it? So Stan Lee changed it from the Fabulous Four to the Fantastic Four, which means, had Martin Goodman not made that change, it would have been the Fantastic Four, who were the first Fab Four three years before the Beatles. The other groundbreaking thing about the Fantastic Four, they didn't have costumes. In fact, in issue three, seen here, they actually try donning typical superhero costumes, but the thing rips it right off. The Fantastic Four becomes almost an overnight success. Issue four, they revive the Submariner from the 1940s. And if we look closely at him, we see in his widow's peak there, years later, Spock on television is basically a remodeled version of Namor the Submariner. The very next issue, Kirby and Lee create Doctor Doom, a suitable villain for the Fantastic Four. Years later, George Lucas is working in a comic book store. Big comic book fan. Where do you think Darth Vader comes from? So much of Star Wars is taken from Kirby's comics. There's something called the, the Force in Star Wars. Kirby had something called the Force. And you could see the Doctor Doom lookalike right there. And they start to get deeper themes in their Fantastic Four comics. In an early issue, they fight the hate monger, which was based on the headlines of the day of the early civil rights movement where the Ku Klux Klan was active in the South. And you can see how they portray that in comic book form. When they take off his mask at the end, who is it? It's Adolf Hitler. That somehow is able to still be alive. The next major anti, super anti-hero is the Hulk to be created in 1962. Now a lot of people think that the Hulk, who turns from a human into a monster, 
is really taken from the whole Jekyll and Hyde idea, Robert Louis Stevenson, the original novel, and of course the movies. But Martin Goodman was a much savvier, much more media savvy guy. He saw the success of the very first Aurora monster model in 1960, Frankenstein, which was an overnight sales success. And he said to Stan Lee, can you do a superhero version of Frankenstein? Now, in the movies, they were black and white. So when the Hulk first appears, Stan Lee colors him green. I mean, it's colors in gray. But Martin Goodman sees this and says, no, I want that green Hulk because in color they decided to make his skin green. And that's why the Hulk becomes green skin. And you can see the success of him years later in the films that were made. The other major super anti-hero that Lee creates or co-creates starts out in a magazine called Amazing Fantasy. It was actually called Amazing Adult Fantasy. These were stories, little eight-page stories that he did with the artist Steve Ditko that had surprise endings. They were pseudo-science fiction. The very last issue of Amazing Fantasy is a feature called Spider-Man that was co-created by the artist Steve Ditko. It is the Spider-Man costume, it is Ditko's creation that you know of from those movies. It is Ditko's creation that has become in a sense, the Mickey Mouse of Marvel Comics. It's the design that you recognize. But what made Spider-Man really the first real super anti-hero of the 1960s? He was young. The DC heroes like Clark Kent, even though they were timid, were adults. Barry Allen, DC's The Flash, was over 30 years of age. Spider-Man was a teenager. And we begin to see in the very first Spider-Man the things that set him apart. The first thing he does when he gets his powers, he doesn't go out and fight crime. He goes on TV to make money. This is reality television 50 years ahead of his time. In the famous scene where he doesn't save the criminal from leaving the building, you can see in Steve Ditko's somewhat crude style, compared to the older DC establishment heroes, you can see the attitude towards authority that later became big in the later 60s where the cruder artwork has more to do with the attitude of Spider-Man flaunting authority than you can see in Carmen Infantino's slicker artwork in which Flash is spouting dialogue we'll hear later on the Batman TV show. The other thing about Spider-Man is that he becomes Spider-Man out of guilt for not saving his Uncle Ben. Now, Bruce Wayne becomes Batman, but not out of guilt, maybe a subconscious guilt as a child that he couldn't save his parents. But that's the major difference between Spider-Man and any of the heroes that came before it, was that there was more of a neurose that makes him a superhero versus getting hit by lightning like the DC Comics heroes. And of course, Spider-Man from the get-go is considered a public menace, a vigilante against the law. He's even scary, because J. Jonah Jameson, who hates Spider-Man, his idea of the hero, like the DC heroes, is the astronaut that we could see in the Life magazine. So images like this were startling and jarring compared to what was happening at DC Comics. And even Peter Parker, in close-ups like this by Ditko, you can see the type of emotion that wasn't found in the cardboard characters over DC Comics. He's a teenager. He doesn't know what's going on. This is 1963. This is years before what later became known as the generation gap. Again, comics are ahead of the culture. The DC techno heroes, as I call them, they were over 30. They were establishment. They got the girl. Peter Parker had the girls laughing at him. Even the Adam, six inches tall, gets the girl. Peter Parker was kind of a nebbish compared to the slick adult heroes of DC Comics, who again got the girl. Peter Parker couldn't get the girl because Spider-Man was in between him and getting the girl. Betty Brandt, his girlfriend, she wanted one of those more adult DC type heroes who got the girl. It was heroes like this, if you watch Mad Men, the TV show, 
It was the DC heroes that resembled the advertisements and the establishments of conservatism that was going on in the day. And you could see Barry Allen and his wife Iris look just like that advertisement. Even in one issue of Spider-Man, he actually punches out this mannequin because the mannequin represents to him these type of establishment men that he would never be. And that's why we see drama like this happening in comics. So again, the DC heroes, older establishment, got the girl. Ditko and Spider-Man, images like this, kept Spider-Man away. And it was stories like this in which Spider-Man would just soliloquize about his situation in panels that reek of loneliness and alienation. This image is the last image of the very first Spider-Man story. It's the size of a postage stamp. But when you blow it up like this, it looks like a German expressionist painting. But Spider-Man took place in the grim, gritty city, the real city of New York. Whereas the DC heroes were in this fantasy, suburban American land. Spider-Man grows up in Forest Hills in Queens. Very different from the suburbanism of The Flash, which was based on the kind of early 60s California modern architecture motifs. You can see in advertisements like this, the work of Carmen Infantino and how it sort of related to what was happening in the culture. The DC heroes would run around in these futuristic cities, whereas Spider-Man and Ditko would be traveling through the drab city of New York that we knew. This was the DC techno hero Adam Strange. And again, the flip side, Ditko goes and creates Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, master of mysticism. Where does he live? In Greenwich Village, in a townhouse. We see that weird window of his. You can go back to the 1940s to a character, the spirit, for where Ditko might have gotten that window. Or maybe the first James Bond film, the year before, 1962, Dr. No, we can see that kind of a window. But what we know about Dr. Strange, what makes him a real 60s anti-hero Marvel Comics, it was the spells, it was the mysticism. It was the fact that he learned everything from the Ancient One that he found in the Himalayas. Now, when this image comes out in 1963, if you were watching American television, what you got from a doctor and his mentor was Western medicine, let's say Ben Casey. But in comics, you were getting Eastern mysticism. Now, comics and Doctor Strange precedes the psychedelic revolution, which was really started by one man in the early 60s, Ken Kesey, who wrote the famous novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which you might know from the famous movie that was made with Jack Nicholson. But it was Ken Kesey, a writer, who was experimenting with then-legal LSD and started to share it with his friends that single-handedly creates what we know of as the psychedelic movement. And in 1964, he actually goes across America in what's called the Magic Bus, dousing Americans along the way with free LSD. And when Tom Wolfe writes his famous book, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, documenting this trip, he says that Ken Kesey was in the back of the bus absorbed in the plunging purple shadows of Doctor Strange. And when we look at Steve Ditko's sort of otherworldly realms of Doctor Strange, this is years before what became known as psychedelic art in the later 60s. So Doctor Strange worlds like this in 1964 we see echoed a couple years later in the psychedelic rock posters of the San Francisco School. One of the very first shows of the Fillmore West called Strange Happenings features an image of Doctor Strange. Here's another bizarre image of Doctor Strange that comes from this psychedelic poster in 1968, which that artist took from a comic page five years earlier. And if you look at the lower left corner, you see the Doctor Strange face that that was taken from. So when you see these otherworldly Ditko worlds, I've read interviews with the psychedelic artists who say they were influenced by Doctor Strange to create these kind of images. In fact, Ken Kesey ran the first trips festivals, which were legal LSD hangouts where you could come and take LSD. He ran things called the acid test in 1966 in San Francisco. 
What do we see but the same images that were festooned on that bus? You can see Thor, the Marvel Comics character. So again, the Marvel Comics anti-heroes are tied in with the 60s counterculture, the psychedelic movement from years before. Thor, he starts out in 1962 as just a kind of a Marvel Comics Superman. He hits his cane on a rock and he becomes the mythical character Thor. Now Jack Kirby, who co-creates him with Stan Lee, he played around with Thor in the 40s. Thor was a villain. In the late 50s, he spells it with a double R, it's another monster character. But by the late 60s, Thor is this mythological, cosmic, star-spanning character. And Kirby gets to work in other mythological characters that he takes from the Bible, like Samson and creates Hercules. Images like this of Thor have a kind of biblical overtone. And whenever the Thor took off his helmet, he kind of looked like a hippie from the 60s, and it's this Thor that you're probably more familiar with from the movies, and even now the comics are echoing more of the movie Thor. You can see the way Odin was done, it's taken right from Kirby's comics. But Kirby was sort of the Michelangelo of comics. Images like this you can see echoed in uh, Michelangelo's Pietà. That's how powerful these images were, and showing the end of the world, the end of the universe. But what made the Marvel comic characters so relevant was that in addition to star-spanning cosmic adventures, they also actually went to Vietnam to fight. And in fact, one of these Vietnam stories has a villain that ends up creating Iron Man. Now, Iron Man was echoed later in the culture by the first Japanese animated cartoon called Eighth Man, which is about a guy that has to create a robotic body in order to live. Years later, after Iron Man, you see the influence in Robocop. But it's that very first Iron Man that you don't only see echoed in pop culture now, but it's that very first gray Iron Man that you saw in that first Spider-Man movie. I mean, Iron Man movie. The red and yellow outfit a lot of people don't realize was also created by Steve Ditko, the guy who creates the Spider-Man costume. There's the first new Iron Man, and you can see Ditko's design which later in the hands of the great artist Gene Coleman became iconic and became the Iron Man that is most responsible for the success of the movie, again, almost 40 years later. Along with Iron Man, they bring back Captain America in 1964. And Kirby kind of updates him. Captain America very quickly becomes the leader of the Marvel Comics characters to the point where when they go on TV, he is the lead character. Captain America also goes to Vietnam and shows the relevance of the Marvel characters. There's, again, the image from Easy Rider. This is an exhibit in Los Angeles a couple of years ago to show you how Captain America has become such an icon of American comics. And that's the story that's from. And here we can see the movie that came out a year ago. And he's going to be the Avengers. The next Marvel character, Daredevil, starts out with that costume, gets the red costume, which you later saw in the movie. Then come the X-Men. The X-Men you know more from the movies than their original comic book character. Their villain, Magneto. You might know Magneto from the movies. Here's how he looked like in the comics. And then you have Paul McCartney in 1974 doing a song called Magneto and the Titanium Man. So many rock stars were comic fans. In fact, there's Paul McCartney greeting Jack Kirby backstage in 1974 at Madison Square Garden. But the other interesting thing about Magneto in terms of the 1960s is if you look at this panel that Kirby did and kind of combine it with another panel from DC Comics, you get one of the most famous Roy Lichtenstein images, the guy who brought comics into the fine art world. You might know Lichtenstein more from his romance comics. Here's Lichtenstein in the 60s. And basically what Lichtenstein did was he took comic book panels, but as a graphic designer would, he recontextualized them and brought them into the fine art world. Lichtenstein and pop art was so popular by 1965, Marvel Comics actually retitles their books Pop Art Productions. And it was right around this time that Kirby, his art takes a giant leap, almost psychedelic. He starts bringing in photographs into his work. He starts making collages 
using photographs. This is also 1965. Double page spreads like this. And it was Kirby's art that really exploded Marvel Comics by the late 60s and made them the most popular superheroes of the time, outdistancing themselves from his DC rivals. This is a spread in Esquire magazine, one of the first mainstream coverages in 1966 of superheroes. And Kirby and Lee were the darlings of the counterculture. Here's Frank Zappa embracing Kirby. And in 1966, sort of like Lee and Kirby are like the Lennon-McCartney of comics, they both enter their psychedelic period. This is when Kirby creates the Silver Surfer. He got it from the culture, the first surf movies, Endless Summer. And you can see when the Silver Surfer starts, his surfboard is very bulky, and within a year, it becomes more streamlined. And years later, the Silver Surfer is such a popular character, you can see him echoed in everything from rock and roll albums. And it was the power of Kirby that you see in images like this with Dr. Doom, an image of defeat and heroism in a single image. The power, what's called the Kirby Crackle. These were all designs and things that ended up being very influential that we could then see in the movies that follow. The next incredible character in that time period that Kirby and Lee create is really the first black superhero, the Black Panther. Now, when he appears in 1966, everybody thinks, well, it came after the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party is formed six months after the Black Panther appears. They claim they were based on a, a voting group in the, in the uh, South in the early 60s, and we could see in literature of these voting groups that were trying to get blacks to vote, you could see the image of the Black Panther, but we don't know if Kirby was aware of that when he creates the Black Panther. The other jungle heroes that predate the Black Panther are Sheena, there's a character White Panther, but it's the Black Panther that makes a difference. In the rejected cover, maybe they didn't want to expose the fact that he was black on the cover because Marvel Comics had Southern clients that would be against it. So the Black Panther appears with a mask. He could kick the Fantastic Four's ass. And who is the Black Panther when he undoes his mask? We see that he's actually an African prince. Now, black people in comics didn't really, they weren't there. In fact, whenever Kirby would draw a black character, the colorists didn't even know how to color them. They were colored gray. Look at this black character, colored dark blue. Steve Ditko of Spider-Man tries putting black characters in, and finally they start to get colored brown, but it was really the emergence of the Black Panther as an African prince, based on actually a mythical African prince named Masu Menzu that was said to live in Africa in the 13th century. So perhaps Kirby, a student of history, took that and he creates the Black Panther. But when Lee would write dialogue like this, from this moment forth I live with one thought, one aim, one goal, this echoes some of the black nationalist ideas of guys like Marcus Garvey, who predate Martin Luther King in the early 20th century, and he had a speech very much like that image of the Black Panther. The next black superhero that comes after the Black Panther is known as the Falcon, but he's an expatriate living in Haiti. And he also was influenced by Marcus Garvey, and we can see the Falcon here. And in 1969, the same year, Captain America appears in Easy Rider. We see Iron Man in Vietnam. And again, this was reflecting what was happening right at the time in American history. So Marvel Comics was right there. What was DC Comics doing at the peak of the 60s? They would have comics like this, Brother Power the Geek, that came and went. But if you peel away the layer, you can see stock characters like Sergeant Rock, who's ostensibly a World War II character, but in the middle of 1968, at the peak of the Vietnam War Revolution, you can see stories like this, Stop the War, I Want to Get Out, that used World War II to make a comment on the Vietnam War. In the same way, this story had to do with a hippie, even though they weren't called a hippie in World War II, who's a pacifist, and he gives up his own life to save his, um, his buddies. And again, it's sort of like 
what was happening at the time. The DC anti-hero, who was the blazing enemy? He was a World War I fighter pilot called Enemy Ace. The idea of making an enemy into a hero is very much what the 60s were about. Now at the same time, Charles Schultz has Snoopy being the, the Red Baron. So at the same exact time, Hubert and Kaniger, the writer, create Enemy Ace with, sort, with images like this. You have the Western, you have Bonnie and Clyde, the first movie anti-heroes. What does DC Comics do the very next year? They create an anti-Western hero called Batlash. That again was more of a lover than a fighter. More of what Midnight Cowboy was. More of what uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid were. The other anti-hero from the movies, James Bond, how is that pop culture craze echoed in the comics? Well, you have DC Comics doing wacky stuff like this, but again, over at Marvel, it went one level deeper. You had Nick Fury from World War II coming up in the modern time and being a kind of James Bond. What happens to make Nick Fury so significant is a new artist comes and draws him named Jim Steranko. He came from a completely different background. He loved the work of Jack Kirby, and he tried to get that energy and power in his Nick Fury stories. And he starts taking Nick Fury and making him much more up to date, much more energized, much more, in a sense, psychedelic in a way. And you could see, in double page spreads like this, the energy and the power. You could see the psychedelic motifs in his artwork. This was actually a four page spread that went across, you had to buy two comics and line them up. But you could see that he was bringing in psychedelic motifs from the rest of the culture that were very much in the culture. Covers like this. Photo collages like this. Just like what Kirby was doing, so was Sarango, mixing photography in with comic art. Where Nick Fury lived was very hip and with it and right off of the pages of the magazines of the day. The op art movement, which was big along with pop art, you could see echoed in Sarango's work, this coming from a famous cover right in 1968, right at the peak of Peter Max and psychedelic artwork. You could see when Sarango would do a sequence like this, how much it was echoed in the graphics of the day, when this character, the scorpion, takes hold. And you could see at the very same time, Richard Avedon is doing his Life magazine psychedelic portraits of the Beatles. So you have Sarango with psychedelic images like this updating the Doctor Strange stuff. You had another artist, Gene Colan, taking Doctor Strange, taking what Steve Ditko had done before him, but doing them his own way. And his layouts by the end of the 60s, breaking down the panel borders, reflected a much more psychedelic attitude, just like Jim Steranko was doing. At the very same time, in underground comics, Robert Crumb was reinventing comics by doing acid-influenced underground comics, which is almost a whole nother story. But Robert Crumb single-handedly creates the look of underground comics that influences a generation. And you could see, he did record album covers, but you could see in layouts like this, in which anything goes, this was underground comics. At the same time, an artist named Neil Adams was doing psychedelic layouts in what we would call overground or mainstream comics. This was Neil Adams. He comes in to the publisher of DC Comics in 1967, just like Steranko at Marvel, a newcomer. DC says new things are happening. They have a character named Dead Man. Who is Dead Man in 1967? He's a circus acrobat. What happens? He gets shot while he's tumbling. He lands on the ground and he becomes alive again. And he seeks out a spirit, an Eastern spirit named Rama Kushna. Now this appears in the fall of 1967. Earlier that spring, the Beatles go to India and start practicing Eastern mysticism and meditation with the Maharishi Yogi. And this creates what is now known as New Ageism, but it starts in the late 1960s. So the writer of Dead Man takes the TV show The Fugitive, 
in which he chases a guy with a hook, mixes it with Eastern mysticism, and comes up with Dead Man, in which he can inhabit the bodies of the circus strongmen. And right from the beginning, Dead Man is much more real. Here he is attacking an opium den. Because the comics code, you couldn't do stories about drugs. And that's what made Dead Man overnight the most talked about comic. And that Carmen Infantino was right in putting Neil Adams, who had come from an advertising art background, not really from comics, but it was commercial comics. And you could see that he was doing a Ben Casey comic strip. You could sort of see the head of Ben Casey there. And Neil Adams starts drawing Dead Man right after Infantino. And you can see images like this, where Dead Man, though he's dead, Neil Adams' realism makes Dead Man really a moat with dialogue like this that we had never seen a comic character emote like before. So there was a realism to Dead Man where the stories became more real. This is Dead Man trying to solve a bunch of immigrants from being smuggled across the border and being murdered. And when he can't save them, Neil Adams was able to draw panels like this that were basically wordless. And even though Dead Man was dead, it was under Neil Adams' tutelage that he was more real and more alive than any other comic character. So what happens? Dead Man in 1968 meets Batman. Batman in 1968, the TV show had just been canceled. It made a fool of the character. In one issue, in one issue in 1968, all of a sudden, Batman becomes more real under the hand of Neil Adams. We had seen that, real, that realism in Dead Man. But all of a sudden now with Batman, we start seeing Batman becoming different. We start seeing Batman become the creature of the night that years later we see in the movies of The Dark Knight. What Neil Adams did, just like those other techno heroes, he went back to the 1940s and updates Batman so that the Dark Knight of today would never have happened were it not for what Neil Adams did. A very year later, Batman meets the Green Arrow. Now, Green Arrow, he used to be a carbon copy of Batman when he looked like this. Batman had Commissioner Gordon and Robin, so Green Arrow had Speedy in the commissioner. There, they would go off to fight. They had their Arrow car. Batman had the Batmobile. This is what Green Arrow looked like. But under Neil Adams, he's the first superhero with facial hair in 1969. Adams was basing his Green Arrow on the classic Robin Hood and restyled his whole costume. You've seen Green Arrow maybe on the Smallville TV show. But it was in this comic that DC finally joins the 1960s. And you can see in things like this that by the end of the 60s, the media starts to notice Comics. Marvel Comics has uh, the Valkyries, Women's Liberation. You can see Spider-Man on campus. The DC characters didn't know how to really compete with that. The Marvel Comics characters were hipper. So the DC characters, by the end of the 60s, one by one, start to die off. And it's images like this where they lost their place. So Neil Adams says, before you discontinue Green Lantern, let me take a shot of it. And they decided to mix the two Green characters, Green Lantern and Green Arrow, in 1970, under the artwork of Neil Adams and his writer partner, Denny O'Neill. The very first story, Green Arrow flies above an urban environment, and he sees some young toughs pushing around an older gentleman. He goes to save him, and then he gets hit on the head by that can. Green Arrow threw the can, and he says, Green Arrow, what are you doing? I'm trying to save that landlord. He goes, let me tell you something about that landlord. And he brings him up into a tenement, and they go up to the roof, and on the roof, a black man comes up to Green Lantern, and he says, I hear you've been saving people with purple skin on the purple planet, and you've been saving people with the orange skins on the orange planet. But I want to know, Green Lantern, how come you haven't done anything for the black skin people? And this is one of the most famous sequences which really brings the DC characters down to earth. 
That might be the first realistic drawing of a black man in comic book history who wasn't just a white man colored brown. And what they do in the series is Green Lantern says, stop running around outer space. Let's go see the world. Let's go see America. And this echoes what was happening as Americans were investigating the society that was tearing America apart. So it was Neil Adams' photorealism that allowed images like this to happen in comics. And they would take scenes torn from the day's headlines, like the trial of the Chicago 7, and put it in comic book form. They were charged with inciting the Democratic uh, riot. You had torn from the day's headlines, Charles Manson being shown in comic book form. You had Nixon and Agnew in comic book form, in stories that were sort of metaphorical and illusional. You had all of the motifs of the day, the population crisis, pollution. You had rights of minorities like Indians. And again, it was Adam's realism that was able to draw American Indians. Marvel Comics, they did their American Indian character, Red Wolf. You had drugs appearing in comics, but without the comics code seal because they wouldn't allow it. In 1971, Stan Lee does this with Spider-Man, but over at DC Comics, they decide to make Speedy, with a name like Speedy, actually a heroin addict. So whereas Marvel Comics kind of did stuff like this, Neil Adams was much more realistic and was able to draw junkies in withdrawal and make you feel that. That's the pencil sketch. And you can see the finished art. And you can see when Speedy tries to tell Green Lantern, Green Arrow, why he became a junkie, it's the realism in Neil's art that makes dialogue like this ring true. Only Neil Adams could really draw a junkie going through withdrawal. Look at that image on the left. If you're an artist, good luck trying to draw a guy going through withdrawal, biting on his hand without any dialogue. And again, you had covers like this that echoed covers like that, that nobody else was drawing that drew home the point. Again, his, his beauty with ethnic characters, to this day, nobody's drawn accurate ethnicities like Neil Adams. You can see it in the pencil sketch right there. And again, dialogue like this, oh, I'm sorry, dialogue like this being drawn realistically, this is 1971, makes this ring true and is still groundbreaking. One of the characters overdoses. Again, Neil Adams could draw panels like this. And in 1971, DC Comics says, let's make another Green Lantern. Well, Neil Adams says they were going to make him another white guy. Neil Adams says, hold on a second. The Guardians come to Earth in 1960. They elect Hal Jordan, white man. They come back in 1966. They elect Guy Gardner, Green Lantern, another white guy. In 1971, they want to do another white guy. Neil Adams says, hold on a second. We shouldn't have a black Green Lantern because we're liberal. We should have a black Green Lantern because it makes sense. So dialogue like this about reverse racism, years ahead of his time, and brought home by Neil's realistic artwork. And again, 1971, they're still not doing stories like this. You have a story like this where Green Arrow encounters a race riot. Neil Adams could draw a kid getting hit by a bullet without showing you the bullet or the hit. But the power of his artwork, you can feel that impact. There's the sketch. And this was echoed in the race riots of the day. That's a picture from Life magazine. And one of the greatest sequences is Green Arrow tries to help this little black kid from dying, brings him into his ambulance. And the writer quotes Hemingway. And he says, of course the world kills innocent people. The world breaks everyone. And afterward, many are strong in the broken places. But those the world will not break, it kills. You turn the page. It kills the very good, and the very gentle, and the very brave impartially. The impact of that last page. Good luck trying to draw a man crying. Good luck trying to draw a superhero crying. 
That's the power of Neil Adams. One of the last issues of Green Lantern, 1972, has to do with a Christ-like protester based on the real-life protests in 1972 in Seattle that prevented the SST from flying in America. That's why there's no supersonic jets. So Neil, Ad Neil Adams and Denny O'Neill echo that story in the comic. The idea of Christ as a character in the pop culture, right at the same time, 1971, we see in Jesus Christ Superstar. We see in Godspell. Even in National Lampoon, Neil Adams is doing a comic called Son of God, which was a goof and a takeoff. And this was all happening at the same time in the culture and in comics. Here's his character, Isaac, who's Christ-like. There's the sketch you can see it based on. And there's the image I showed you in the very beginning of the presentation. Just like Christ, he gives up the ghost and he dies in the sequence. And Carol Ferris, the owner of the aircraft, says, I suppose progress must always claim victims. Again, silent panel that only Neil Adams can draw with those intense, realistic facial expressions. He destroys the entire aircraft in one blow. And he says, send me a bill. So by this time, you have panels like this that Neil Adams was able to draw that represented exactly where America was at the time, having gone through the tumult and change of the 60s. We've changed. I'm older now, maybe wiser too. Maybe wiser and a lot less happy. From sketch to the finish, how he gets across that feeling. And that's how Green Lantern and all these heroes were able to go from this idealism of golly what a feeling it is. The very thing that got Americans to Vietnam, golly what a feeling it is. And that's how we get the superheroes in the 60s and comics and counterculture. It was this image that I did when I first taught a class 10 years ago that later led to my book, The Silver Age of Comic Art, which was this sort of lecture in book form. When you open up the book, the very first image you see is that early 60s image. When you turn the page, that image is ghosted on the left, and then you see that Neil Adams image. So what I'm laying out to the viewer is, again, this book is going to tell you how we got from that image to this image through the artwork of these incredible artists that you've seen today that I consider, like in this ad I put together, they are the greatest generation. So you'll have a chapter on Jack Kirby. And I would take the comic book panel or the page and I would turn it into something slightly different this being a self-portrait of Kirby, because he saw himself as the thing. Now there's been, if you're a comic book fan, you know there's been a fight between who created the characters, Kirby or Lee. Well, I tend as a comic historian to take Jack Kirby's side more, because when you look at his artwork, he was actually telling the story first and writing notes in the margins for Stan Lee to do the dialogue. So I'm doing a presentation and a panel at the San Diego Comic Convention that I'm calling the Auteur Theory of Comics, how it's the artist who takes a script and draws it who's the real storyteller of comics. My Neil Adams chapter, I show a little bit of how, what he did with the X-Men. Look at the sketch down below from the sketch to the finish. I did a sketchbook of Neil Adams' work before my Silver Age book. And again, this book you can still find if you're an artist and a fan. It's really about the art of sketching itself. Now, I wanted to put Batman on the cover, but DC Comics wanted too much money. So this is the title page. And that's, in a sense, actual size of that sketch. And in my book, in one fell swoop, I show you how Neil Adams recreates Batman in a single issue with images like this that became known as the Dark Knight. In the Infantino chapter, again, I go through those speed images and I try to show how, in my opinion, as an art historian, I don't have any problems comparing comic art to fine art, where I was taught that one of the greatest 20th century delineations of motion was Marcel Duchamp's new descending staircase. You have the famous Japanese wave that I find the beauty 
in comic book art just the same. In my own artwork, I would be influenced by incidental panels like this. I had to do a poster for Alfa Romeo. Here's another poster for Alfa Romeo in which I wanted to have a race between the mythological Mercury and the car. And what did I base it on? I based it on when Superman meets the Flash. There's my pencil sketch. And there's the finished art. And I even based my lettering on classic comics. Here's an action comics that I found the original art to. And I put it together in what I would almost call a verbal visual essay. And you can see here how I've taken these combo panels and rearranged them. So it looks like a comic book, but all the words are Mort Weisinger talking about how he worked with Superman. And you can see that silver image of Superman comes from the very first comic book I can recall seeing as a child. And in my book, the very last page, I pay homage to that great silver statue image. The very last page of my book is a one-page autobiography where I show how I was raised, how I learned to read from comic books, how my idea of Mount Rushmore is that, instead of putting Reagan, like the Republicans want to do, on the cover. There's me in summer camp. The Superman comic is at my feet. I'm five years old. That's a postcard I sent back to my mother. This is me in eighth grade doing an oral report on whatever you want to do it on. So what do I do it on? I try to figure out how to work comics into whatever I was learning in school. The lawsuit between Superman and Captain Marvel with visual aids for extra credit. Tom, do they still have visual aids for extra credit? Uh, in some in classes. School? In some classes. Huh? In some classes. Okay, well there you go. The very last panel, that's back when I had a goatee. Uh, a friend of mine gave me a quote by the great existentialist writer, Albert Camus. And then my friend said, Arlen, this image, this quote is you. And it says, a man's work is nothing but the slow trek to rediscover through the detours of art those two or three great and simple images in whose presence his heart first opened. Thank you very much.